Welcome to the Holy Bible Study for Genesis chapter 49. Now, this is a very important chapter in Genesis, one of the most important, because it encapsulates the futures of the children of Jacob Israel going forward and their descendants all the way through the history of Israel. Because he's going to bless each of his children before he passes. But when he blesses them, it's going to be through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is going to preach prophecies over each of them about their futures. That will be their blessings or their curses. So this is a very prophetical chapter. It's a very meaningful chapter. And we can see in the history of the children of Israel just how each of these prophecies were fulfilled in their lives and in the lives of their descendants. So... Let's just jump right into it. It's a long chapter, so start at verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So here, while everything that's going to happen to them that he's prophesying isn't going to happen in the end times, which is which the time I believe we are living in, but... What he meant was in the future. So he's letting them know this is prophecy. So going forward in the future, these are the things that are going to befall all of you. Gather yourselves together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel, your father. And obviously Jacob's name is also Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Now, before we continue here, he loved Reuben, again, because he was his firstborn. We're going to find that just as God had taken the rights of other firstborns and given the secondborn the title, or so-and-so a title, as opposed to the firstborn, an inheritance, etc., we see it all throughout the Old Testament, where the firstborns are overridden because of mistakes of their own, we found that Reuben had slept with his father's concubine. And a lot of scholars say that it wasn't just a sexual thing. Because in those days, whenever a child would sleep with the concubine of his father, it was basically that child saying, now I am going to be the one in charge. I am assuming the power of the family. Now, since Reuben did that, we're going to find why Jacob is going to go on and speak more over him besides just what he just had spoken regarding Reuben as his original firstborn. Verse 4, he continues about Reuben. Unstable as water, you shall not excel. So here we go from, you're the beginning of my strength because you were my firstborn. Excellency of dignity excellency of power. That's what you should be as my firstborn. But you are as unstable as water. You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then defiled you it. He went up to my couch. So there again, seems like it's going to be a blessing, but it's actually going to turn out to be a curse for Reuben's descendants in the future because of that great sin that he committed against Jacob. Next, we read about a couple of others who got in trouble with Jacob. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. Now, why would a father talk like this about his children? Because if you remember, Simeon and Levi were the ones who slaughtered the whole town of Shechem, all the men of Shechem, because of their daughter, De- their sister Dina being raped, Jacob's daughter. Now again, I said in that chapter, when they were doing that, that it was wrong no matter what. I mean, they should have went after the guy, maybe beat him down or something, or see that he got punishment, but murdering a human being in God's eyes is wrong in every instance, whether you're a man of God or not. So they would have been wrong just for murdering Shechem, the guy who raped her. But instead, they murdered the whole town. So they went over and abundantly above what they even thought they were entitled to do 
because of the wrong that was done to their sister. So irregardless, they were wrong. And Jacob here is pointing that out. He's like, you too, though my sons, you are cruel. I'm not proud of you for that fact. O oh, my soul, come not you into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor be not you united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Now, what he means here by, in mine honor, do not let them be united. And when he says, do not enter my soul into their assembly, he's basically talking about he doesn't want them to be assembled together. He doesn't want them to be hanging out together. He doesn't want them to be together. Because when they're together, they devise cruel plans. So he's saying, you two are going to be separated in the future. If you still are going to be a part of my family, you're going to be separated. Cursed be their anger. Now notice, a lot of people will run through this and be like, oh wow, Jacob cursed Simeon and Levi. He did it. He cursed their lust of anger. He cursed anger, their sin. He didn't curse them. Like even Lord Jesus said, pray for your enemies and those who despise you and use you and speak all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake. Jesus said, pray for them. Don't curse them. He said, bless, don't curse. So, it boils down to love the sin or hate the sin. So you can call out their sin all day long, like I do in my books and on the website, about some of the most abominable sins in our society, in our nation. But as far as the people, I pray that God would save them, and that they would repent and get to know my Lord like I do. So I wish that God would bless them in that way, while turning them away from their wicked, abominable sins, which are cursed. Their sins are cursed. Just like the anger of Simeon and Levi is cursed. For it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, and scatter them in Israel. So there you go. Prophecy is Simeon and Levi are going to be divided. They're not going to be together anymore, and they're going to be scattered. Now, that is prophetically fulfilled in the future. Because Simeon his tribe is going to basically become non-existent in the children of Israel and the tribes of Israel. He is going to be melded into and molded into other tribes. His descendants are, by marrying into them or whatnot. So Simeon is virtually going to disappear. While his name in the tribes of Israel will always be known, he's going to be scattered amongst them. And as far as Levi goes, if you remember they became, in the future, because of the good thing they did for Moses when they stood up for Moses and took his side um, against the idolaters, God blessed them by making them his priests, calling them as a man unto his own. So what happened was they didn't inherit land with the other tribes of Israel. They were basically scattered in their own little cities across the borders of Israel. So this prophecy was fulfilled. In the future, we can read in the scriptures. And verse 8, Judah. Remember, Judah is the one Lord Jesus descended from. And we're going to get a messianic prophecy here. You are he whom your brethren shall praise. Now, of course, we know, as I've taught in the past, Judah's name means praise. So here it's, it's a pun, it's a, it's a play on words. Your hand shall be in the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. So he's saying all the children of Israel, all the other tribes of Israel are going to bow down someday to Judah. Guess what? Not only do all the tribes of Israel and all their descendants bow down to Judah, but every single human being in the world whether Jew or Gentile, bows down to Judah. Why? Because, again, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Messiah, descends from Judah. So he represents Judah, the tribe of Judah. And it says in the Holy Bible, one day, whether you believe in Jesus or not, Jew or Gentile, you can be an atheist or an unbeliever, or you can be a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Muslim, whatever. One day, the Bible tells us, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Yahweh. So the Bible tells us, whether you like it or not, 
before you leave this earth, before you go to heaven or before you go to hell, you are going to bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, all the way back in the very first book of the Holy Bible, Jacob, Israel, was prophesying that. He said, your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. That's again where later on we get the term, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's Lord Jesus Christ. From the prey, my son, you are gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? And here's the messianic prophecy. Verse uh, 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Meaning the kingdom shall not depart from Judah. And even though the worldly kingdom of Israel departed for thousands of years, and now Israel's back again, but, you know, after the kings David and Solomon, etc., etc., their sons, it seems like the kingdom was ended, like it stopped. So God's promises must have failed. No, because Jesus is the king of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah, he assumed the kingdom. He is the king of it. He's the king of the world, king of the universe. So, that is why the scepter shall never depart from Judah, because Jesus, being the Messiah, is the only one who can rule that kingdom in the end. Just as he rules the king of, kingdom of heaven with the Father right now. So, it shall not depart ever from Judah. It will never be transferred to any other tribe. And the lawgiver shall not depart from between his feet until Shiloh come. Shiloh there is translated as peace. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So until peace come, this person named Peace, who is the Prince of Peace, if you know your Holy Bibles, you know that's the Lord Jesus Christ, until he come. And unto him, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall the gathering of the people be. Remember, he said, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden in labor. Come unto me, and I shall give you rest for your souls. Because if you come to me, by me, I am the door, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father in heaven, but by me. So only through him shall anyone ever get to heaven. So through him shall the gathering of not only the people of Israel be, but the people of the entire world. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now, if you're reading this thousands of years ago, what does all that mean? I mean, all you have to do is read the story of Jesus Christ, and all this jumps out at you. Vine. Jesus said, I am the vine. Jesus is the choice vine. Ass's colt. What did he do? He rode into Jerusalem on an ass. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. When you look at garments that are drenched in wine and grapes, it looks like human blood. And of course, Jesus said, My blood is as wine and my body is as bread. So there you go. I mean, it's all spelled out for you right there that that's who they're talking about in the scriptures is the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning they're meaning Jacob and Moses, who recorded this later on. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth with white milk. So, there, I believe, later on in the Old Testament, when it's talking about Jesus coming to fight Antichrist, I want to say it could either be in the book of Isaiah or the book of Zechariah, possibly even Jeremiah, because there's a lot of Latter-day prophecies in those three books that people don't realize that refer to the end times and Jesus Christ returning and battling Antichrist in the end. And it talks about that. It talks about him uh, washing his garments in blood. Who Who is this to come forth with blood-stained garments? And it talks about his eyes being red. And uh, teeth white with milk. I mean, so all this in the future is talked about concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zidon. So here we jump over to Zebulon. But you notice so far, God and the Holy Spirit point out 
These are the main sons of Israel you want to pay attention to. These are the futures you really want to focus on. Number one, Judah. Because how many paragraphs did he get in his prophecy? Whereas a couple of these other guys, they get one paragraph, maybe two. But God really focused there. He zoned in on Judah. He's going to do the same thing with Joseph. But here, Zebulon, who most people, if you ask him to name the 12 tribes of Israel, he may just skip people's minds. They may not even remember Zebulon. And that's because this is basically all he was. He was just going to be a, a sea seafarer, you know. He was going to be a father of those who travel on ships. Um, and it talks about where his border will be unto. And Zidon, I believe, is in Lebanon, I want to say. And Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens, and he saw that rest was good in the land that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. So there, Issachar, nothing really special. It's just talking about he was strong, but he fell in love with rest. And so he fell in love with a little bit of the lusts of the world, and then he actually became a servant where he shouldn't have been. And Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. So here's another one. You're reading it right off the bat. Just like we saw with Reuben, ah, looks like Dan's going to get a good blessing. But then things change. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path, that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. Now, to me, that sounds pretty bad. Doesn't sound like a good blessing. Why would Jacob talk like that about Dan? What has he done wrong thus far? Well, it's not about what he's done wrong yet. It's about what he's going to do in the future. And that's why we know that Jacob is blessing through the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is prophesying the future, saying this Dan is going to be a bad dude. And we find a prophecy of what he did right at the tail end of this verse, where it says that he bites the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall backward. What does God call his children so much in the Holy Bible? Backslidden because they fall away from him. What is one of the main ways children of God fall away from him? Serving false gods. And Dan, we find later on in the Holy Bible, was the first of the tribes of Israel to lead Israel into idolatry. So much so that his name was virtually blotted out from the names of the tribes of Israel whenever they're mentioned later on in the Holy Bible. Very rarely do you find his name mentioned, and that's because God said, All idolaters I will blot out from the name of heaven. Now, thank God for God's great mercy towards Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Dan will receive land with the other tribes of Israel in the millennium. But during the tribulation hour, his tribe is not mentioned as protected with the other tribes of Israel. God's shield of protection is not upon him like it's upon all of the other tribes children of Israel, who are of the 144,000 witnesses, which I write about in my new book, The Coming Signs of Our Times. So the tribes of Israel are very prevalent and very present in the book of Revelation, more so than Christians, and I give all the reasons why that means that Christians are raptured, because we're not present throughout the tribulation. It's just unbelievers, and then you have the Jews who become God's new evangelists. But Dan will not be protected in that tribulation. Because he made the children of Israel to fall backward, to fall away from God through idolatry. Next, we're going to zip through a couple of other names because, again, God doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to them and they're just going to be kind of average guys and nothing really to know about them. But in between this, in between Dan and the next name we're going to get into, Gad, there's a peculiar line in here in verse 18 that's just kind of just there randomly. And you'll say, well, why is that there? And I believe it's because after all these blessings, Jacob paused, spoke these words, and then picked up again on the blessings and curses of the children of Israel because he knew that his time was near. He knew that he was passing on from this life to Israel. So get it. In verse 18, after he speaks to Dan, he said, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. So here he's not talking to Dan. He has obviously stopped doing that. 
And why would he say he's waiting for Dan's salvation after he just basically cursed Dan? No, he's saying, I'm waiting for the salvation of the Lord. Waiting for your salvation, O Lord. Who is the Lord's salvation? Who is Yahweh's salvation? The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, the name actually means Yahweh saves. So Jesus is the salvation of the Lord. He is the one who Jacob Israel is waiting for. Just like David waited for Jesus Christ. Just like all those Old Testament saints, Isaiah, Daniel, Jeremiah, they all waited for the Messiah. Abraham, Isaac, waited for their promised Messiah, who has been promised from the beginning. As I said, you can find prophecies of Jesus all throughout the Holy Book of Genesis and all throughout the Old Testament. Jesus is legit in every book of the Old Testament. You can find him in every book of the Old Testament. So he didn't just first arrive in the world in Bethlehem's manger. He has been around since the Garden of Eden. And you got to go back and listen to all the Genesis studies for all of my reasons why. Too many to recoup right now. So here, he's he's pausing from the blessings. He feels in his strength of his body and in his energy that is passing away from him, that he's getting ready to pass on. So he says, Lord, I've waited for your salvation. I can't wait someday to see your salvation. Now, people will say, so what do you mean? So Jacob went right to heaven with Jesus Christ when he passed away? That doesn't make sense. Because we're told that without Jesus Christ, no one get to heaven. That's true. And Jacob, Israel, per se, didn't really go to heaven when he died. All the Old Testament saints, um, Shem, you got Abraham, Isaac, Noah, David, Daniel, all these great men of God did not go right to heaven when they died. Because their Messiah, who would save them from the sin that they were cloaked in since their youth, like all human beings are, the only one that could cleanse them of that sin is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So where then did they go? It's explained by Jesus in the New Testament when he talks about there is a comfort side and a punishment side, a hell side of hell, Gehenna. Basically says when you pass on from this life before he came along, all the Old Testament saints went to the comfort side of Gehenna, which was also known as Hades hell. Whereas all those who did wrong, who disbelieved in God, who were idolaters, who were murderers, who were rapists, all the evil people throughout history, all the Cains of history, they went in the punishment side, the hell side, which was also known as the pit, the abyss. So, and we see Jesus illustrate that so beautifully. When he's telling the parable, he said, you know, the rich men went down into hell. And he could see across the other side the servant who had went into the pleasure side, the paradise side. They could see each other because there was a divide between them, but one side was filled with flames and darkness and it was hot as hell. And the other side was like heaven. It was like paradise. But after Lord Jesus came, it says he set the captives free. That means he went into that area of Gehenna or Hades, however you want to refer to it. And he basically transferred the comfort side into what we know today is the third heaven, where him and Yahweh today dwell. So now all that's left of that plane between what was then known as heaven and hell is just hell now. The pleasure side has been removed. Those in hell cannot see those in heaven any longer like they could before Jesus came. It's a long story. It's a good study to get into. I will definitely cover it when we get into that chapter with Jesus. I may cover it some more and further studies, but it's going to take up too much time tonight. So you may want to do some research on that, um, about when Jesus taught about that parable of the rich man who had went to hell and that poor servant who was on the comfort side of what was then known as hell, Gehenna, Hades, etc. But there was still a comfort side and a punishment side. Now the comfort side's in heaven. Punishment side is forever, eternally hell. Okay, so Jacob waited for the salvation of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ came, 
he went into that comfort side of Hades, Gehenna, however you want to call it, and he got out Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, David, got them all, brought all the saints up to what we now know today is the third heaven. All right, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. So Gad obviously is going to be like a man of war, and I believe his name actually means a troop cometh. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. So there of Asher, it seems like he's going to have a royal bloodline, and I believe he does amongst the children of Israel. Naphtali is a hind let loose, he giveth goodly words. Joseph, now here, so there you just had a couple more guys there, God saying, really don't pay much attention to these guys. They got a sentence blessing, so, you know, their their people will be well off, but they're not going to be that important in the history and the future of the children of Israel. But get it, you remember Judah, God paid a lot of attention to Judah. Who else is he going to pay a lot of attention to? Joseph. It says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Now Joseph, he endured great trial and tribulation for most of his young life. I mean, we read about it in the last dozen chapters or so. We read all about it. But what does Jacob say here? But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. His bow abode in strength. Now here's another play on words, because bow is symbolic of the rainbow through which God made a covenant with all mankind, with Noah. So here, if you read it in that connotation, but his covenant abode in strength. His covenant with who? The God of Jacob. The arms of his hands were made strong. Through what? Through faith in the mighty God of Jacob. That's how. That's where his strength was. God has said, I am your strength. All our strength is found in the Lord. Faith in him, hope in him, trust in him. And from there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Who is the cornerstone of Israel? The Lord Jesus Christ. Here, Joseph was the cornerstone of the tribes of Israel, but who was the ultimate cornerstone here? That's why it's in parentheses when you read this in the King James Version, and I believe in other versions. From there, from there, it's from Joseph's faith and trust and hope in God that the shepherd is coming. The stone of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're in verse 22. Even by the God of your Father who shall help you, and by the Almighty who shall bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your Father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills they shall be on the head of joseph so jacob saying all my blessings all those goodly blessings you've watched me enjoy in this life that were passed down to me from abraham and isaac oh joseph those are all going to be upon you you were my most beloved son now, he's not going to say that because he doesn't want to favor joseph in front of the other sons but there's no doubt throughout his life jacob loved Joseph more than the others. It's just a fact. So he's saying all these blessings, all these good things that have come upon me are going to come upon you. And they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Benjamin. Now Benjamin, remember, was Joseph's little blood brother. It was the last son of Rachel to Jacob. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, what that means is it means he's going to be a man of war. And he is going to do a lot of fighting. A lot of fighting. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. 
and this is it that their father spake unto them, and blessed them. Every one according to his blessing, he blessed them. And he charged them, and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim the Hittite. Where is that? Remember, tomb of the patriarchs. Remember the tomb that Abraham had purchased. It's where Abraham and Sarai are buried. It's where Isaac and Rebekah are buried. Again, these are the father and forefather of Jacob, Israel. And it is where Jacob and his wife, Leah, will be buried. Not Rachel, unfortunately, because we already read that she died um, outside of Bethlehem. I go into detail about that, about why Rachel had to be buried where she was in Bethlehem, as opposed to in the tomb of the patriarchs and the matriarchs, which is also referred to as the double cave, because it does indeed contain both the husbands and the wives of the patriarchs of Israel. So that is where Jacob is telling Joseph and his sons to bury him. He's like, bury me there. In the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which today, as we know, is the land of Israel, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob, Israel, had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. So for those of you that don't know, yielded up the ghost means that Israel passed away. And we know that from, if you go into the New Testament, when Jesus was passing away on the cross, spoke his last words, and it says he gave up the ghost. So the ghost here would be referring to like our spirit, our soul would return to God who gave it when our earthly body passes away. That's why it says in the Holy Bible, when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. Because when our souls, our spirits leave the body, they're reunited with the Lord. But then thanks be to God, after the rapture, uh, when we come back down to earth with the Lord Jesus Christ to defeat Antichrist and all the armies of this world who are coming against Israel to destroy God's people and nation, when we come down with him and we live with him and the Father in the New Jerusalem, we are all going to get new glorified bodies. So I believe we're going to go back into our old bodies, which are going to be made glorious like unto Lord Jesus Christ's glorious body. And from what I've heard from studies from theologians, None of us will be over the age of 33 years old. And why do I say that? Because there's a very powerful verse where it says, When we see Jesus, we shall be like him. He died at 33 years old. So we're going to be somewhere between the ages of, I'd say, maybe 18 and 33 years old. Because if you pass away at 70, then you go back down in age. Obviously, if you pass away as a child, I've read that the babies actually become children in heaven. They're not actually in heaven as babies. And there's some proof of this in people who have had heavenly experience who go to heaven and say, you know, I had a near-death experience and I met this this young child or this young teenager and he was talking with me and he was saying like, oh, he can't wait to really spend eternity with me because he wishes he could have did it on earth. Turns out that was a woman's aborted child when she aborted him at birth. But he knew her and he knew he was her son because obviously God revealed that to him and he was revealing it to her. So I don't believe there'll be babies there. I believe there will be children in heaven but not of a too young of an age, because they have to be able to commune with each other and with you. And um, I don't know how that's all going to work. Obviously, I'm not in heaven, but I just know that we will not be older than the age of 33. So all of you people who are 70, 80, 90 years old, don't give up hope. You will again get back to your body of your youth. Um, so that's what Jacob longed for, because again, at this time, he is way advanced in age. So that's why he was saying earlier, in the chapter that he could not wait to meet the Messiah, his Savior. And when he made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet under the bed, 
yielded up the ghost, means he gave his spirit, his soul to God. He passed away and was gathered unto his people. Who were his people? Again, he was gathered to that paradise side of Hades. So all of those who passed on before him, Abraham, Isaac, Noah, Shem, etc., uh, Abel, Enoch, he was gathered unto that side of Hades, which was the heaven side, the comfort side, paradise. So that's where he was gathered. And um, that will do it for chapter 49. We only have one more chapter left in the book of Genesis. I can't believe it. We finally made it through the entire book of Genesis. But then we've got another long book to start on next. We're going to start on the book of Exodus. A lot to come. I hope you all have enjoyed all of these Genesis studies, and we'll share them with your friends if you have. And until next week, my friends, as always, God bless you all, and Godspeed.